Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where we've got another Databricks newscast today. So we're looking back at September 2022 and saying what went on in the platform, what new features were there, what's changed, have they gotten hidden all the buttons? Yes, they have. And we'll go and have a look at all that stuff. If it's your first time around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let us know down in the comments which of these features are the one that you're most excited about. What do you what have you been waiting for, if any of these things? Now, I will say there isn't a huge amount of changes that went in in September, but we'll take a look and see what's gone on inside there. So, let's crack on nice and quick. Okay, as always, I've got the month of September up here. I'm looking at the Azure release notes. There are release notes for Amazon and GCP, so make sure you use the right one. I'm going to start right down at the bottom so we can go chronologically through all these re uh, new releases as they went. So, first up, we've got the Databricks runtime 1.2. It's gone GA. Now, we talked about that runtime in the last newscast because it was in beta in the previous month. And it's now got GA, so feel free to use it. That is all good, nice stuff. Look at this idea. So you can view and organize assets in the work workspace browser across personas. That sounds all fancy. Essentially, what we used to have in Databricks SQL is you had the idea of queries and dashboards and all these objects, but you didn't see them anywhere in terms of your the workspace. You couldn't, you didn't have a workspace when you're in your Databricks SQL mode. And essentially, they've made that available. So if we dive over to Databricks, we can dip into SQL. I can see I've now got my workspace here. So I can go and see what's inside my workspace and see all the different things I would normally see. And when I write a SQL query, that gets saved into my Databricks SQL environment. I can go and have a play with it. You didn't used to get that. You used to just have queries and SQL editor and not be able to see those objects you've created anywhere. So now we can actually see it in our workspace. We can save it down. We can go and look at what other things people have done, even if, even if we're not in Databricks SQL mode. So that's really useful. So that's gone in there. So now whichever persona you're in, you can see the workspace and it's just a little bit more consistent experience. Makes sense. I've uh, got the ability to search for tables using Data Explorer if you're using Unity Catalog. So I'm going to dive in. I've got a Unity Catalog enabled version of uh, Data over here. I'm in my Data Explorer, so I've just clicked on the data side. You can see I've got a load of different things in here. And this is talking about this new thing. So I can type in products and get a list of all the different tables I've registered across all of my Metastore that come up with product or even contain something. So I've got fat sales there, which isn't called product. But if I look inside, I know that product exists as a column inside there. So just nice, nice way of exploring the dictionary. You've got general search. You can go and find things that are either inside a table or the name of the table itself. Just quite useful. Really good. There's a few other little bits and pieces I've seen go into Unity Catalog that I didn't quite see captured anywhere. Things like the ability to say what's actually changed in there. So who are the frequent users? Who are the what are the frequent queries? As well as some nice little shortcuts to just go create a notebook off my existing thing. I didn't see that in there previously. That's quite quite nice little feature that's gone in, which is cool. So yeah, we've got a new search in Data Explorer only if you're using Unity Catalog. Okay, we've also got uh, Lineage is now available. So right now in public preview. <laughs> so if you're having a play with it before, we've done a video about it, but that's automatically if you're reading data from a Unity Catalog registered table into another Unity Catalog registered table, it'll now automatically get that lineage for you, so you can go and explore that. I've got an example, I might as well just show you to remind you what that looks like if we dive into data, dive into my adventure works. I've got a table that I've played around with here. I've got this lineage idea is now in preview. You can see where did they come from? Where did they go to? Which notebooks were involved in doing that movement? And you can see this lineage graph to get that idea of what various different things use that. What's the most big nest of dependencies? So that is now in public preview. So you can go and have a look at it. Um, other bits and pieces. So we've got a rename. So Delta Cache has been renamed to Disk Cache, which just does make a lot of sense. So Delta Cache is that thing that's only on certain, um, only on certain machine types. Uh, will allow, will automatically do some caching. Uh, so essentially, if you're bringing in data from something kind of from a Delta table, and you're using the machine type that is Delta Cache accelerated then that will automatically keep a copy of that Delta table on the local SSDs. And they call that Delta Cache. But there's also another type of thing called Delta Cache where it kept the transaction state in memory. And everything is called Delta because that's how Databricks work. And they thought, you know what, maybe we have too many things called Delta Cache. So Delta Cache acceleration is now known as disk caching. So it should automatically work using the right kind of cluster. And then it'll go and expand from that. And yeah, should make a lot of sense. So it's the local storage of the parquet from a delta table only with delta only with um delta tables 
and only if you're using that right thing. And it's only on um, certain Azure Databricks um, that's just as types things. Okay. Other one is we can now use Databricks jobs to orchestrate SQL. So if you've got a few things that you're doing in, inside Databricks SQL and you want to just run that query, maybe you've got some actual create table statements in there. Maybe you just want to update that SQL object. Maybe you're doing an insert statement from somewhere. So if you've got some arbitrary bits of SQL that you've written in Databricks SQL, you can now actually kick that off by a Databricks job, which I think is all part and parcel of that, including it in the workspace, making it an object, making it a thing you can browse to. So that's now plumbed in. So if you're doing anything in pure SQL and you want to automate it, you, want to, you can now put it inside a Databricks job. Okay, we've got some new open source integrations. So you can actually sort of go and have a look at what things are actually sort of uh, plumbed into that. So you can go and kind of have a play around. I haven't really had a dig in there, but it's essentially just a link to what open source integrations are in there. So rather than the partner connect stuff and seeing all that, you can see what open source things there are, such as DLT, DBT, those kind of things. Okay, you can now go and set cluster policies directly inside uh, Delta Live Table. So again, it used to be that thing where you have to edit the settings in the JSON and then go and have a play around with that. They've just improved the UI a little bit. So you can go and actually just tweak and tailor what cluster it's going to use in your Delta Live table when you kick it off. Again, what well, we've seen is kind of steady improvement, more and more being added, to, added into the configuration screens rather than having to open up that JSON file and start adding and trying to remember what the various attributes are called, looking it up in the documentation, pasting it in. It's just nice that we can now do it straight through the UI. That's getting better and better. I've got two ones for the audit logs. So if you're doing any... I think essentially, if anything changes with how you're managing your Git repos, or especially the credentials used to log into it, that will now appear in the audit log. So if you're putting out logging to log analytics via the Databricks workspace diagnostic logs, you can now, you'll now see these events saying, oh, someone's changed the credentials to my Git repo. And that's obviously a very important thing to be able logging. So that's good. And also web terminal. So if people are actually sort of uh, opening up the web terminal, starting a session and closing a session, and you don't want people to be doing that, or at least you want to trigger an alert, trigger a workflow when everyone's doing that kind of thing. Again, that's now something that's going to appear in your diagnostic logs. Just gives you a little bit of safety, a little bit of good governance. You can go and keep an eye on who's doing some of these things that could expose some people being naughty, essentially. All right. Well, the navigation bar changing. This is what I was saying about hiding all the buttons. So if we are in a particular notebook, let me just grab a notebook up. Gonna dive. I'm in number one. I'm gonna switch back over to my uh, data science and engineering. Let's just dive into data sharing. So if I've got um, a notebook open here, and if I wanted to go into the admin screen previously, I'd have kind of little some little buttons down here, and they're they're gone. My buttons have gone. I no longer have my admin and all that kind of stuff. And what they've done is they've moved up here. So under here, I can see all my different workspaces that I'm working with. So all the different workspaces that are in the same tenant that my uh, user has access to. And then under my name, I've got those things I'd normally see. The admin console, user settings, all of that good stuff. Console, if you want to do Unity catalog, Metastore management, that's there. So that's just a quick shift. It used to be down there. It's now up there. Easy. We can deal with that. The other thing you'll note is that just generally the layout of things on a given um, workspace page has changed. So you can see we've got the cluster is now where it's moved over to the right. Ah, shock horror. But rather than telling us the cluster there's on, it'll just tell us the state. We have to open up and we can see what the cluster is uh, now connected to. So that's changed a little bit. And I know certainly certain people, Gareth, give a call out. He's really annoyed that there's no longer a big chunky button saying run that runs all the cells. You've now got this drop down button for run. You can pick which one it is. And apparently some people are too lazy to hit shift, alt and enter and just run the whole thing. But still. So just be aware, next time you're logging into Databricks, there's a few things that are now in a different place. If you're trying to go to the admin screen, that's now in the top right. You're trying to run something, there's now just a drop down with different types of run. Again, you get used to it. Just change. We don't like change. Go and have a look. It's changed around a little bit, that's all. Uh, the small regions for Unity Catalog. So Unity Catalog, when it first came out, wasn't available in all regions. So I had a lot of shenanigans creating a, uh, trying to create a UK South. I couldn't, it didn't exist. And we can now go ahead and do that. So for me, that works perfectly because that's my normal uh, Azure region. So hopefully that's kind of ticking off the boxes for a lot of people. Just whatever region that they're actually sort of they're storing their data in currently, you can align your Unity catalog to that. And then finally, the final little piece. So there's um, it's essentially a kind of a blueprint solution for doing uh, NLP processing. So if you're going to do um, any kind of 
text extraction, you're trying to do anything with kind of large amounts of raw text and you want to kind of just do some machine learning on it, there's some nice new uh, things plugging into Spark ML. It's got a load of things in there. Uh, specifically, Spark NLP is part of uh, Spark ML. So there's loads of things. If you're looking at doing that, I would check out that because it's got a few examples about how you're going to do it. It's got a nice little kind of essentially a pre-made notebook. You can go and have a look. And a lot of that is off the backs of um, there is a partnership with John Snow Labs doing lots of that kind of uh, they're doing kind of um, medical text extraction and saying, well, that's that's a diagnosis. That's a body part. That's an inj injury. So all that kind of stuff. There's loads of stuff in there. Go and have a look. There's loads and loads and loads of detail in there. And obviously that the libraries themselves are super powerful. Uh, there's a few things in there. Obviously, because it's using the machine learning stuff, that's going to need a um, Databricks ML enabled runtime. And then you'll actually have a lot of this stuff pre-installed. And yeah, that's about it. As I said, not huge amounts of things going on in September. There's a few more things that have already cropped up in October. We'll cover those next month. And we don't have a beta runtime to have a look at yet. There is one out, but we'll have a look at that in October once it's in its full GA state. So, yeah. Essentially, we've got things in different places. Uh, we've got some nice in Unity catalog, just getting more features, getting more usable, getting more extra niceties going in there. And, yeah, we've got kind of covered some gaps in auditing, logging, and that kind of stuff. So, that is it for me. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know which of those pieces you actually like. Do you like the new layout of the buttons? Are you horrified because you have to click twice to click run? Oh, terrible. Let me know down in the comments, and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.